Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Let's stand up as we get ready to worship today.
We're going to sing a new song this morning, so feel free to just read along until you pick up on the melody and then join in as you learn it. Exactly. 
Church one more with my arms that's why I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. It's all Nothing else fit for 
Let's give it up for Adam one more time. That was amazing. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. My name's Leah, and I am um, one of the prayer leaders here, and it's my pleasure to open us up in a word of prayer this morning. Um, during this time, we like to pray for certain things. First and foremost, we want to pray for you. So if you have any specific prayer requests, we ask you get those to us. You can do that via the Connect card. There should have been one in your program. Um, if not, there are some in the seat backs in front of you. You can just fill that out and you can stick it in one of the lock boxes. You can take it to the VIP section in the front atrium or you can just leave it in your seat. You can make it anonymous. Um, we want to be praying for you. So any prayer requests you have, we just ask that you get those to us. Um, also, we want to be praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters across the globe. We were watching a video after service, but we recently transitioned to receiving the offering. Um, I'm going to pray for the offering as well. Um, and the church that we're going to be praying for, the country that we're praying for this week is Iraq. And I was reading up a little bit about Iraq, and out of the 44 million people, in Iraq, less than 1% of them profess Christianity, and that's just crazy, um, less than 1%. So, and there are probably a lot more than that, but um, they, don't, they don't talk about it. They don't, you know, profess their faith in public because they fear persecution. So we'll be praying for Iraq. We're also going to be praying for Israel this morning. And um, like I said, we're going to pray for our offering. So um, after I'm done praying, we'll pass baskets around or you can go online to um, hope, uh, hopechurch.com. HopeAugusta.com. HopeAugusta.com. You can give that way. If you call Hope Church your home, you can continue to worship God in your giving at that time. If you're a first-time guest with us, we don't ask anything of you. But um, we want to continue to worship God in our giving so that we can um, support our mission partners and ministries um, that we've been called to do. So um, we'll go ahead and pray this morning. Dear Lord, Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you so much for allowing us to come together to worship you freely without fear of persecution and lord i know there's so much heaviness in the world right now there's so much heartache even in our congregation this morning um, i just pray lord that whatever we're going through this morning next week that lord you're just with us that we continue to make you the center of our focus and um 
just continue to be with us, whatever distractions we have in our mind that are clogging our, our minds this morning, that you just free us from those so that we can hear what Nick has to say, so that you, we can hear your message through him. And I pray for him this morning, at, or no, actually his father, Tim, he's going to be praying, he's going to be uh, preaching for us this morning. I pray for him um, this morning as he delivers your message. And I also pray, Lord, for the country of Iraq. You know what's going on over there. You know that there are so many people that can't, can't profess their faith without fear of harassment, discrimination. And, Lord, only you can work miracles in those people's lives, the leaders. And I just pray you continue to give strength to those that believe that they can continue to spread your word and reach more people. And, Lord, I also pray for Israel um, there's so much hate, and I just pray, Lord, that you just sweep through their nation and just bring healing and, and free them from everything they're going through, Lord. And I pray um, for our offering this morning, Lord. I just pray that you, we know every good gift comes from you, and Lord, I just pray that um, you help us to be generous with our, not only our money, but our lives so that we can continue to worship you and continue to make an impact in our community and to those around us. And Lord, I just we love you so much and we thank you so much for everything that you've done, everything that you continue to do. And we know that it's not always our plan, it's your plan for us. And Lord, I just pray for everyone here today that whatever's going on in their lives, that you just help us always feel your goodness. We love you so much. Thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm glad to see uh, you survived the eclipse. I think we've been through six end of the world events lately, and I'm glad you made it through. It's an important study we uh, are in, and uh, the discussion and the debate over creation is one that is ongoing, and as Pastor Nick brought last week, is uh, important to us in our lives, and we're going to be continuing in that, uh, that study and thought of the Scripture this morning. Uh, believers uh, hold to the reality and the truth of the creation that uh, God created all things, and we're going to look at the verses this morning, and what we're wanting to look a little bit about <clears throat> the debate that is... Uh, uh, always in controversy in science and many times if you're not careful in the church you can get afraid of science and we do not need to be afraid of science uh, god is the creator and he has given us science as an ability to understand and see many of the marvels uh, of the creation of the world around us but we do live in a world i um, have been reviewing over the last few weeks some of the articles and it's one of those subjects when you begin to get into it. If you, uh, how many of you love science? 
<clears throat> there's a few subjects we do well in in school, and there's a few that some of us didn't pay as much attention to as we probably should have, I being one of them, and you just squeeze through some of those courses. And when you get into some of the topics, as you begin to go back and realize, there's some things you probably should have paid attention to, and uh, it can get pretty technical, and it can get pretty detailed, and many times, if we are not uh, very careful, we can just kind of check out and let the world and the media, which has uh, taken the, uh, the secular position and has pushed it uh, to, as though it were truth, and in fact, it's not. And, but you, you are going to be hard-pressed to find an article. In fact, if you use any of the search engines and you begin to search, the, the results are going to come up as though it is a matter of fact and settled point of uh, some of the opinions that science has, and they don't even want to debate it. And then if you read some of the articles, uh, what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll kind of admit that they don't have the answer, but even in the admission that they don't have the answer, they refuse to accept the fact that that proves their theories wrong. I'm glad this morning that as a believer, we have the authority of the Word of God and what it says, and it will teach us and tell us about the beginning. And uh, so when we look at um, this this morning, I want you to first, we're going to first look at what, what was the plan of God in creation. And as the creator, he is the sole proprietor. He is the owner. He is the master of the universe. He is the one that gets to call the shots. He created it all. And the Bible said in the book of Genesis chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 1, in the beginning, God, and the first thing we need to understand is that's not the beginning of God. In the beginning of everything we know and everything we see, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The God said, let there be light, and there was light. I like to, uh, I'll stop there for a moment, you know, it, one of the things we'll talk just a little bit about, Nick talked a lot about last week, is one of the theories that science has is called the big what? Big bang theory, remember? Uh, I think we have a little bit of that because God said, let there be light, bang, there was light. <laughs> um, in fact, the New Testament tells us, we'll look later on, where everything that we see was created not from something, not from some particle that was floating around somewhere, and from it began all life. In fact, the Bible tells us that from nothing, everything we see was created, because it was created by God's word and God's edict and God's demand, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning one day. <clears throat> now, let me uh, tell you that you will hear people. Sometimes it'll be the secular world, and sometimes it'll be the uh, not-so-intellectual in um, people who are believers who have gone to college and gotten way beyond their wisdom. Uh, they'll tell you that the Hebrew word for day in the Old Testament is yom, and that is true. And it could mean one 24-hour period of time, or it could mean one year, or it could mean 1,000 years. And so they, if they're not careful, will say, because God said uh, it was one day, we'll take it and mean that, well, that, maybe that's a million years. And though there are some who try to mix the secular world with the biblical world, and they'll come up with what's called theistic evolution, God evolution. It's not biblical. Because if you look in the Scripture and you want to go ahead and study Hebrew, then you'll also need to understand that every time the word yom is used in Hebrew, and it is combined with a numerical uh, accounting of that time, like one day, the second day, the third day, every time it's used that way, it means a 24-hour period of time. And God knew we'd get too smart for our britches. 
My wife occasionally looks at my pants and said I put on my smarty pants. And I don't know why she says that sometimes. But uh, God knew we'd get too smart for our britches. And so he brought it down into terms. And he said, listen, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then he separated the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And it was one day. I'll tell you this, God knows the span of one day before he let us know the span of one day. And he also, if you study Genesis, he created light and darkness before the sun and moon. We think the sun and moon creates the day. No, he gave us the sun and moon to rule over the day and rule over the night and to judge the, the, the times and the seasons. But God knew one day before one day existed and God created the world, and he created light and darkness, and that was the first day. In the beginning, God created from nothing everything that we have. Now, science will debate. And what they've done in science recently uh, over the, the last 10 years, 15, 20 years, uh, and so is they have changed from observable science to origin science. Now, the difference in observable science, which is proper science, where you take and you study what God's creation is, and you begin to try to understand the marvels of creation, and you begin to do tests and examples and understanding, and you repeat it, and you begin to understand science. That's observable science. And then there's origin science, where you find a bone in the dirt, and you clean it up, and you bring up this bone, and you look at it, and you say, well, now, where did this bone come from? And you begin to conjecture where it came from. That's how they created an entire man in their chain of evolution that came from the tooth of an extinct pig. It's the truth. You look it up. They, they, they found small bones, and they create entire objects, and they go back and try to take what they find, and then they conjecture about how it came to be and how it must be and, and, and came to be formed. The difference in, um, in observable science and origin science begins to uh, compete with each other. We find the Bible, which is the inerrant word of God, and I appreciate the series that uh, Nick brought us through talking about the word of God and, and the, 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 the facts that we have. Listen, we do not need to take a step back to the world and act like we're scared to, to, to hold up our Bible and, and say, listen, I have the word of God and I am able to stand on the word of God and I am able to depend on the word of God. I don't have to be afraid of what you go out and you try in your experience. You are never going to contradict the word of God. It's never been contradicted. You're not going to. I'm not afraid of what you can find. What I am going to do is keep you honest in what you find so you can't take your conjecture and you can't take your theory and you can't dampen the truth of my Bible because my Bible will stand on its authority of God's Word by itself. Science will only prove the Bible to be true. And by the way, they've never found a contradiction to the Scripture. Never found a contradiction to the Scripture. And all of those who say, oh, well, what about this? You go ahead and study the supposed contradictions. There are none. We have an authoritative Word that we can stand on, and God gave it to us for a purpose his plan was in the beginning, he wanted to create this world, and he created the world, as we will see, so that he could create man for the purpose of living on this world, dominating this world, and fellowshipping with him. He created us with a free will and a free choice. And the Bible said that he knew that even by giving us the ability to freely choose to serve him and to worship him, we would also choose not to. But he loved us so much that even before the foundation of the world, he planned the plan of redemption that would come from the creation. And so he created the world perfectly. And he created that was his plan all along. Exodus 20:11 helps us to understand we talk about a six-day creation listen a, a young earth they call about old earth young earth the the bible tells us and gives us lineage and the the world and everything that was created was created in six days six 24 hour periods of time isn't it interesting <coughs> that there are people in the world 
who don't mind a God who can create things as long as he can create it in a million years. But their God is too weak to create everything in six days. I'm glad my God's strong enough to create anything in six days. It didn't take him a million years or a billion years to create the things that we see around us. The reason we have such a hard time about it, folks, is because we are called finite. The word finite means we have boundaries and limitations to our understanding. We see things and we, we, we understand what we can touch. And the problem is the world tries to take that which we do not understand and God, which is infinite, without boundaries and without limitations, and we try to take God and put him down in our finite mind. And that's difficult to do. We can't comprehend it. We begin to want to. And that's why science wants to get rid of God out of Genesis. If they can take Genesis out of your Bible and make it incorrect, then what other book in the Bible will they not be able to take away? Because if God's word is not true in Genesis, what makes it true in John? I'll tell you, the word of God is true in Genesis, and he created the world in six days for a purpose, and it is true in John too. All the way through, the Word of God is reliable and dependable. And so the beginning, the creation, God, the infinite God without boundaries, we as finite man try to interpret the best we can, the presumptions and the understanding. <clears throat> That's why the lost world is always looking for the next smartest guy. You notice how they've done that? Go back in history. People used to sit around uh, a one called Aristotle. And they thought Aristotle had all the answers, and they would listen to him, right? And then you get up into the modern age, and they had those people that were in their garage that uh, were good buddies, and their names was Gates. Remember those? Uh, and and uh, Jobs that created the uh, Apple and the window and supposedly fought each other and hated each other and stole from each other and the world will sit around and listen to the gates of the world and the jobs of the world because they're the next smartest thing. And we have those that are clamoring for the next person of tr that, that has the, the most truth that the world is looking for. And all of a sudden, some guy that creates an electric car named Elon Musk, now he's the most brilliant guy in the world. And so... Everything he says, we wait for it. Have you noticed? What did he tweet? What did he Twitter? What did he say? What did he mutter? What did Elon say? I don't care what he said. He's flesh and blood. And the ones who like what he said is when he says something they agree with, oh, he's the smartest person in the world. You let him say something they don't agree with, and they flip over here and go, man, he's an idiot. You watch it. And unfortunately, in our country, it all aligns around what? Political parties. So if he says something one party agrees with, oh, man, he's brilliant. You ought to be listening to Mr. Musk. And if he doesn't, well, oh, we don't know where he got his thinking from. Elon Musk might be a brilliant mind that God has given him a brilliant mind, but he's a finite man with limited understanding. And you will not get your answers to life from Elon Musk or Aristotle or Steve Jobs, or Bill Gates, or any of the rest of the world that wants to clamor around finite man looking for understanding. So much effort is put into trying to understand through our limitation the things we see but cannot comprehend. Faith is feared by the lost. Faith is feared by the lost. The reason they want you not to trust Genesis is because if they can get you to doubt creation, then they don't have to deal with the fact of where did death come from? How did death come about? Death came about because of sin. Oh, no. What do we got to talk about? Sin. Sin is rebellion against a creator God. We don't want to talk about that because if we have to talk about our sin, now we're accountable. So let's ignore the God and let's try to forget about what brought death to the world and let's push that aside. That way we don't have to talk about our sin and we don't have to talk about our lostness and we don't have to talk about a Redeemer God. 
because if I have a creator God who owns everything, I'm responsible to him to live my life like he wants me to. But if I can get him out of the picture, I don't have to worry about that. I can be my own God. And that's what the world tries to be. That's what science tries to be. Get God out of the picture and replace him with yourself. The creative activities of God cannot be explained in mere terms of natural law. And so science takes the little things we learn, the things we learn as finite man, and we learn a little something, and all of a sudden we're the smartest thing on the, on the planet, and we begin to try to take an infinite God and push him to the natural laws. God created everything, and he did not have to create it based off of the natural law that we see. He created it supernaturally. The Trinity was involved in the creation in the beginning. God the Father spoke his will of creation. The Bible said in Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke it. God willed creation to happen. Colossians 1-19, for it was the Father's good, the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, talking about Christ. The Bible tells us that not only was the Father part of creation, but Jesus, the Word, the Son of God, was sent forth in creative power. The Bible tells us in the familiar portion of Scripture in John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that came into being. Jesus Christ created all that the Father willed. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 1-2 that the Holy Spirit uh, hovered over the face of the earth as a creative power uh, and, and said the earth was formless, Genesis 1-2, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And not to get off track because we were talking about running rabbits and trying not to do that, but I was on my way to church this morning and the thought hit me that uh, I need to bring up, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it up right here because, because this is as good a place as any. The, the, the same Holy Spirit that was the creative force over the waters of the earth is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. That same creative power is the one who lives in my heart, who when I'm beginning to rejoice and to sing with the songs, who begins to stir up inside of me and say, isn't he a wonderful God? Isn't he a blessed God who will raise my spirit and be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. That comes from the Holy Ghost, the same Holy Spirit that hovered over the water. And my Savior is my Redeemer, and my Father is the one who I make my petition to. The same Trinity was part of the creation in the beginning, and he had a plan that he might take man and, and, and have a fellowship with man, and that man might worship him, and that there might be that fellowship for eternity. That was the plan of creation. Now listen, when God created everything, God did not create a baby Adam, did he? He did not create a baby Eve. In fact, the Bible tells us that everything he created when he created it was fully created and fully formed. How are you going to date that, by the way? Oh, by the, they use something called radiometric dating. Uh, it's the kind of thing that they, they have a hard time with because they put it on something that they know is not real old, and it says, uh, well, this mollusk who you just brought out of the ocean that's still alive has been dead 32,000 years. And they say, oh, well, I mean, <clears throat> when you're considering the great span of time that they put up in their own mind of a billion years, what's 32,000 years among friends? Well, what's 32,000 years dead to a living mollusk? It says your method is wrong. It says your conjecture is wrong. Why don't you go back to the Word of God? But they have a problem with that. Man was created fully formed. The earth was created fully formed. When the trees were brought forth and the birds were put in the sky, they were full grown. Uh, and, and, and the age of the earth cannot be counted by the minute understanding of man because we don't know what God formed when he created the earth. We know when he created it, though, it was fully created, fully mature, and not a baby. 
And so Adam and Eve were created fully formed, ready to dominate the earth, ready to rule over the creation that God had given. The Bible tells us um, that, uh, that, that when the trees were created, they were ready to produce seed and fruit. You will see that in Genesis 1.12. The earth brought, fruit, brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and listen, and trees bearing fruit. When he put Adam and Eve in the garden, there was already fruit to eat. You can debate whether it was an apple, a fig, a banana that Eve ate. Whatever it was, it was already there when they got there. They didn't have to wait for it to grow. When the trees were put in the garden, when the trees were put on earth, they were already bearing seed and already bearing fruit. They were fully formed and fully functional. God is sovereign over the universe and the galaxies. Picture of the universe and we see its vastness. And we look up into the stars. I, I like living out where we live. We live out where there's no very few street lights. You get out to where our property is, you turn off the, the lights on the front porch. You look up and you can see the constellations and the stars and it is beautiful. And you can get out there on a clear night and you can look up and you can think, my, how great God is. How wonderful is this creation. And that is what all of the world sees, the vastness and the amazing creation that God has made when we look up at the universe and we see everything that God has placed. And the Bible said that God created the sun and the moon and he created them to rule over the day and the night. And then he said, and he created the stars also. I heard someone say, why would God, for mankind, why would God create a billion upon a billion stars if it was just us? I would like to think, how could God do less? I mean, he only had 24 hours, so he created only a quadrillion stars. And he said, well, let's stop at that, okay? Day's getting late. Quadrillion ought to do. And as science begins to try to understand what is there, I read an article <coughs> where they began, and <laughs> Billy, I'm sorry, but uh, you, you're, you're doing a good job of trying to keep up with me here. Independent article where all of the scientists are looking at the amazing universe through the space telescopes that we have put up there. And they're beginning to find new discoveries. And this article says, the galaxies, excuse me, the galaxies are spinning in different directions. Scientists have discovered that could change, listen, that could change our understanding of the structure of the universe. In other words, uh-oh, we got it wrong. All of a sudden, what we thought was happening, we can't explain it anymore. If you read that whole article, it says, this is in conflict <clears throat> with the previous understanding of the structure of the universe at its largest scale. And they claim that the unexpected results would not be the result of error, but rather showed the unusual structure of the universe that surrounds us. Amen. Man cannot understand the creation that God has given. And when we think we have it nailed down, we create a stronger telescope. And it's okay. Don't be afraid of the telescope. And they look and go, uh-oh. What we thought we had figured out, we got it wrong. Something else must be going on. And it goes against their Big Bang Theory. And it goes against their inflation theory. And it goes against their science theory. But do you think they go back and change their theory? No, because doing so would have to admit that maybe those radical believers who believe in a creator God might just be right. And they don't want to do that. <clears throat> the stars were placed for his glory and for our praise of his power. Psalms 102.25 said, of, you, you, uh, of old you founded the earth 
and the heavens are the work of your hands. Hebrew 1.10, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. <clears throat> the heavens were made by God for his glory, and they declare God to everyone on earth. I want you to follow with me in Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. We're going to stop there for a moment because those words are intentional words given by the psalmist, by the, by the hand of God, to say the heavens declare. Not only do they represent, don't, don't get that word declare as though, oh, the heavens represent a powerful God. They not only represent, but they declare as though they were to have a voice. Because he goes on to say, day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. Verse 3, there's no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard, but their message has gone out to all the earth. And their words to the ends of the world, in the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. So the psalmist is saying, the heavens are there, and when you look up into the vastness of the universe, the heavens are saying, look at my God. Look how great the Creator is. And when the sun rises up in the morning and it goes across the sky to the other side, the sun is declaring, blessed be the name of the Lord. We serve a mighty God. Look what he has done. Look what he has given you. That's what the heavens are declaring. They are declaring the word of God, the praise of God. Even though they don't have a voice, you look up and go, wow. And that's why people who don't know the name of God, who don't know the hope of the gospel, that's why you have tribe nations who look at that and they think, oh, there must be a God somewhere. We'll call him this. They just don't know his name. And that's why we as Christian missionaries ought to be taking the gospel to every ends of the world, that they might learn the name of our God and the hope of the gospel because they know there's a God. The heavens declare it. The heavens say it over and over. They just don't understand. And so God says, not only is the declaration comes from the heavens that you see to get your attention and ring the bell. I used to like to go to children's camp. <clears throat> see how far I went back here. I like to go to children's camp because one of the nice things they would do early in the morning after it was time for calisthenics. <laughs> Blessed be the camp. <laughs> I used to like calisthenics. Uh, I used to could do calisthenics. <laughs> My wife and I had a race the other day, by the way. You'll have to ask her who won. Um, <laughs> she, she had this naive belief that she was going to outrun me. But I get a banana split out of it, by the way. Amen. <laughs> Children's camp, after the morning calisthenics, You'd be going back to your room, cleaning it up, and making the bed. Uh, they used to do that, young people. After you'd make the bed you slept in. Uh, and, and so we would go be going back to get our room straightened up. And all of a sudden, you'd hear, ding, ding, ding. They were ringing this big old farm bell. And what it meant was, breakfast is ready. You better get up here. Because all the hungry people are going to come, and if you're last in line, good luck. The bell was declared, and that's what the psalmist said. The heavens are ringing the bell. There is a God. There is a God. And then he followed it, it said. We, he gets our attention with the heavens, and because they are not giving us the word, then he gives us, look at verse 7, he gives us the instruction of the Lord is perfect with the word of God. He's gave us the created heavens to know he's real, and then he's given us the word of God to give us his instructions and his precepts. The instructions of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the, uh, the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant. Get the picture like the universe? Making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They're more desirable than gold, than the abundance of pure gold, sweeter than honey, which comes from the honeycomb. 
So he said, you have the created world around you to get your attention and declare to you there is a God, and you have the Word of God to tell you the instruction of God so that he can speak into your life his purpose and his plan for every area of your life. He loves you that much, that he did not leave you without a roadmap, that he did not leave you without direction. He loves you that much that he'd give you the heavens to see and the creation to behold and the Word to read and to make part of your life. And then consider mitochondria. That'll be that, that slide with the little squirmy thing. Looks like a worm. I didn't do very well in microbiology. But not only does the universe declare God, but microbiology declares God. And as scientists begin to try to understand, why, why mitochondria? Well, as I understand it, and if you're a scientist, a doctor, or a nurse, forgive me if I get this a little bit wrong, but I... I believe I've got it understood. It's my understanding that mitochondria, one of the smallest components in your body and mine, is the powerhouse that drives the fundamental processes of life. It is that which creates energy and regulates calcium and participates in metabolism and influences the programmed death of cells so they don't just keep reproducing when they need to stop. That's all done from the intelligence of a mitochondria, a small thing that you have to see with a microscope that is made primarily, I understand, of three components. And I read an article where they were pr uh, proclaiming in one of the science articles that, they, uh, that, that mitochondria has for all of the years been a problem for evolutionists because it is so intelligent and it is so smart about what it does in our body that they can't even understand how it could just happen. But I read an article where they were working at it and they said, well, there are three main components and we finally found where two of them could actually join together. But without the third, it's useless. But we believe, this is, what, this is what they said, we believe that given another billion and a half years, they probably could have joined with the third one. You hear what they say? And they said, in unfortunate admission, but even if they were to join together, we don't understand how they know what to do, how to do all it does. Why? They don't know him. They don't know him. And in the beginning, God created the universe. And inside your body, he created the mitochondria, which is the foundation that gives us life and helps us for who we are. Blessed be his name. His plan was to create this entire world and to, as a creator, to give us the appreciation of our Creator. We do not need to fear science, but we must not let science be dishonest. I'm going to say this, and I don't mean to be sound harsh. If I do, forgive me. I like, <laughs> I think of my daughter-in-law, she likes Starbucks coffee. I like Starbucks coffee once in a while. It's real strong for me. I, I did, a, we'll just leave it there. And, and so, nothing wrong with, I'm not preaching against Starbucks coffee. <laughs> but I'm, I'm amazed at how we in the, in the house of faith will, will subscribe to services that the world offers us. We'll spend our money as we want to on things we enjoy. And nothing wrong with that. If God gives you the money and you want to spend it on a car or you want to spend it, but if, if it's in his will and he gives you permission to do that, go ahead. And if you want to drink yucky coffee, it's your business. I don't, you know, it's not, no problem. It's not, not, a, not a problem. But you know, when it comes to these things, there are resources that are available. And, and, and I find this in Christian education over the years, and I find it true in the church. There are things that will help you. And if you have an interest to be able to understand and defend the faith, and understand where science is going wrong, there are resources that you can get a part of, but they're probably not going to be free because people, it costs to do that type of research. Answers in Genesis, for example, might cost you $10 a month. But you ought to find some good resources there. Uh, right Now Media, it's free. You get it free. And many of 
the free subscriptions have gone not even attended and they've got creation studies on there if you really want to understand put your mind to it <clears throat> we are so tweetered out if it's not 144 characters we don't have time for it and we need to put our mind to study and to understand and there are times when we should i hope some young people become christian scientists i hope some young people become christian astronomists i hope some young people become part of the, in, the, the, the vital part of what God has provided and do it from a biblical Christian perspective and not from the world's secular perspective. There are resources. You should make yourself known of those and available. Not only is his plan, but his provision. He provided everything this world needed to sustain life. He provided everything this world needed in order for it to go on. He provided everything that it needed for man to, over, to rule over the earth and to dominate and to worship him. He, he, he gave us all of the provision on earth that we needed so that we might fellowship and worship him. Uh, that, that the provision that man could share in the overflowing love of God and the grace of God. He gave everything we needed and provided and we went our own way and erred in our own sin and even in that then he began to provide to us every good thing James 1 17 says every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of light with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow in the exercise of his will he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a first fruits among his creatures. He has given us provision to have the will to be able to choose and serve him freely and worship him. He's given us a provision of redemption. And that's what we come as a body of faith to come together and to glorify him and to give him glory. The, the redemption to restore man at the brokenness. The reason we have a hard time understanding that God originally created the world in its goodness and there were no briars and thorns and death. And we have a hard time, so we have to try to take all that we see with this brokenness and understand how could that have been a perfect creation. It was perfect before we messed it up. But even in that, God brought about restoration. And the same God that created the world is the God who is our Savior. The same hand that created the world in power is the hand that formed the mountains and made the sea is the same hand that healed the blind when he walked on earth amongst us and fed the 10,000. The same hand that, uh, that stilled the troubled waters is the hand that has calmed the troubled waters in my soul. The one that reached down and picked up Peter when he was walking on the water and beginning to sink. How many times has he reached up and picked me up out of the sinking waters? And it's the same, the same God, the same Christ, the same Savior. He's had a plan and he's made a provision that we could, it's all about him. The plan for your creation and my creation was so that he could provide a way for us to worship him. It's all been provided by the hand of God. And we see his, his purpose. <laughs> the Bible said, very simply, God created all things for his pleasure. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Colossians 1.13, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's part of his provision. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. For in, by him, verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him that's the purpose of your life is to be created for the purpose of god in your life isaiah has a caution the last portion of scripture we'll read this morning isaiah 45 verse 9 woe to the one who argues with his maker one clay pot among many and he put us in our place there you look around and you think oh <laughs> I wonder what God would do without me. Well, he'd do plenty. <laughs> he kind of put it real simple, didn't he? You're just one clay pot. I'm just one clay pot amongst so many. Who's going to argue with their maker? What, what, what clay says to the one forming it, what are you making? Does your work say he has no hands? How absurd is the one who says to his father, 
<laughs> what are you fathering? Most of the time, the fathers ask that later. What did I father? <laughs> Who says to his mother, what are you giving birth to? Verse 11, this is what the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and its maker says, ask me what is to happen to my sons. Instruct me about the work of my hands. I could preach right there for a little bit because he's, what is he saying to us? He said, I'm the creator. I'm the one who owns you. I'm the one who knows where you're going. If you'll be obedient, I'm the one who's got the purpose for your life. The only thing is, are you willing to listen to what I want to say to you? Because I can tell you what I intend to happen to your life. I can tell you what I want to happen to the child, my children's life. Are you listening to me? That's what he said. I made the earth, verse 12, and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. God is the creator. He rightfully owns title to everything including our lives, magnified with the price he paid for our salvation. He has the right to direct our paths. He provides through his word the direction for his will. Over the next few weeks, Pastor Nick's going to walk us through important areas of your life and my life that God has written out the instruction book for. He wants to tell us what, and, 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 and culture will say, oh, don't you go down there, just like they will science. We got it figured out. You listen to us. We'll give you a better way. No, you'll give me a way that will lead to destruction. That's why my young people are suffering and struggling because they're not listening to the direction of God. That's why young couples, young families are struggling because if you quit following the word of God and the plan of God in these important areas, there's trouble coming. A difficulty coming. The maker, the creator, the one who is molding you as the molder and the maker of the clay is saying, I've got a purpose for you. You need to be here in the next several weeks so that you can hear the word of God in these important areas that culture is trying to destroy and the word of God is giving us clear direction on. He's created all of creation for one purpose that we can be redeemed. Blessed be his name. Are you worshiping him as he deserves to be worshiped this morning? Are you living in and through his purpose for your life? Now, I'm not talking about general. I'm talking about for your life, your purpose for your life. Are you fulfilling it? Because if you're part of this fellowship, God has a purpose for you. And it is more than look at beautiful faces on the stage. There's none up here, by the way, this morning. Are you attempting to rob God of his possession in your heart, your soul, and your obedience? He owns you if you're a believer. He owns you if you're not a believer. You just don't understand. He's the creator. He's the owner. He has authority. Amen? Amen. Father, help us. As we take this truth about the beginning, your plan was that we would be able to to have everything we needed, Lord, that we might serve you and worship you because you provided everything we need. It came from your hand, not ours. Oh, you've let us learn so much, and science has come a long way. But we think because we understand one thing in science, we understand everything, and we don't. There's so much we are yet to know. We may not know it until we get to where you are, Lord, and you take us home. But until then, we do know this. You are our maker. We love you. We love you not because we are lovable, but because you loved us when we were unlovable. And Lord, we have given you as believers our life. We surrendered our life to you. And Lord, sometimes we want to take it back. We want to direct it ourselves. Sometimes we just think we kind of fit in a little bit. It's so, it's so, the, the world will make it sound so strange to believe in a powerful God like we are privileged to know and to, and to understand. And sometimes, Lord, we just don't let you have your way. We ask you what you're doing with us. We question what you're making, and we try to hold a reserve to the fashioning of the clay 
And you have told us, Lord, you're the creator. You know the beginning and the end. And you have a purpose for us. Help us to live in that, Lord. If we do not know you this morning, if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, nothing, Lord, begins without life. And life comes through Jesus. And without Christ, no man shall see the Lord. And Lord, we pray you'd bring that one that does not know you first and foremost to your feet to be able to understand you are there because you love them, Lord. You died for them. You paid the price that they might be your child, redeemed and part of the kingdom. We pray, Lord, for us as believers that we will hear your voice and obey the Spirit and be obedient in our walk. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thank you, Pastor Dad, for uh, uh, helping take us one, one step further. Uh, over the next several weeks, we will continue in this series talking about um, the ethics of work, the ethics of marriage and sexuality, the, mar the ethics of our identity, all that spin out of Genesis, but also out of our Creator God um, and how He has designed us and how He has instructed us in those things. Um, today, as we close out our portion of time of worship, uh, we are going to do so with communion as we do every um, second Sunday of the month. And so we will not have a closing song today, um, but we will be receiving our uh, uh, the Lord's Supper, and then um, I will close out after we're finished with some parting announcements and things you need to know. And so today, just to kind of uh, help you understand, if you're not a regular with us, um, how we do things, uh, we'll have a couple of people at these two tables here that will be serving the communion. Uh, I'm going to share the scripture with us in just a moment. And uh, as you come, uh, there's one cup, and as I share with everyone who's always worried about that because they're looking at it, because I would be, uh, the, we do not drink out of that cup together. Uh, you will take the bread, which will be provided to you. Uh, you will dip it in the juice, and then you can find a place at the altar if you would like to, to pray. You can go back to your seat if you want to use it as kind of a, a, an altar, if you want to just sit. Uh, this is self-guided, uh, and it's your opportunity to uh, do as the Scripture tells us to do this in remembrance of Him, uh, the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus that He uh, has gone to the cross as we celebrated uh, with Good Friday and at Easter, um, His broken body, His death, um, His shed blood, which was necessary, uh, that, blame, that, that bl unblemished blood uh, for the redemption of our sins uh, so that we could ultimately have life by placing our faith in him and in his resurrection. And so this is our moment to pause, uh, to worship him, to remember that, um, and to, uh, to, to give him glory and honor uh, for that act that he did on our behalf. Uh, we, as we share each month, uh, there are a couple of people who should not, uh, you should refrain from receiving according to scripture. Um, first and foremost, this is for those who uh, are followers of Jesus, those who have place their faith in Jesus for salvation. And so if you're here today kind of checking things out, exploring things, but you've never trusted Christ as Savior, um, then we would invite you to remain in your seat um, as this is a moment for us to recognize the gospel and the power um, of, of the gospel in our life. And so this is for believers, for those who follow Jesus. And then the other would be this. The scripture tells us that if there is um, anyone here that you have um, something with a brother or a sister, someone that you're out with, that you have not uh, sought forgiveness, you've not extended forgiveness, maybe there's bitterness there, something along those lines, um, then also the scripture says it would be better for you to leave the table and to go and make things right with that person, at least to seek um, in doing everything in your, your power um, to be at peace with them uh, than to receive this in this moment. The reason why is because, once again, this is a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. It's a reflection of the gospel and us offering forgiveness, us seeking forgiveness, or us apologizing and, um, and, and seeking forgiveness for our own wrongs uh, is living out the gospel. And so we should not do something symbolically if we're not doing it um, in our everyday life. And so um, with integrity, it would be better for us to go and to make things right, or to at least do everything in our power to do so before receiving this. And so there will be no um, judgment. You won't feel awkward remaining in your seat. Uh, no one in this congregation, no one among these people um, have that heart or that mindset. And so you can freely remain in your seat and know that 
Um, uh, no one is casting any judgment on you, uh, and you can remain there and pray or do whatever you need to do individually in your seat. So I'm going to read the scripture, I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, our, our host will come to serve that, and you can line up um, and begin receiving uh, communion after the scripture. So um, let us read, or after the prayer. Um, in Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have had to not only look to the scriptures, to see that you are our creator, um, to see that the universe declares your glory and points us to you. But we also thank you for this moment that we have the elements that have been provided in um, the bread and the juice um, that Jesus himself took and broke and drank and pointed his followers to do the same. And that equally it points to you as Savior, that it points to you as our Redeemer. And so we thank you for the broken body that Christ has, um, that, that Christ offered on the cross. As in Hebrews, as he shared that you, the Father, had given him a body to be offered, that you did not desire um, the blood of bulls and goats, that you had given him a body to offer. And so we thank you for the suffering that he endured and that he went through so that we might have salvation. And we thank you for the shedding of blood that was necessary, that unblemished blood, that it would be the remission and the payment for our sins. And ultimately, we thank you that he did not remain in the grave, but though broken and though his blood was shed and though he um, suffered death, he did raise again to new life so that we, as we have placed our faith in Christ, might rise and have new life, both in this life, but also in the life to come for eternity. And so we thank you and we give all praise and honor and glory to Jesus for his sacrifice today. We do this in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hosts will come. You can line up and begin receiving communion. And they do have little cups if uh, you have a gluten allergy that you can request um, as well.
Well, some of you may still be praying, and that's fine. I just want to, first of all, thank Adam for joining us, to leading us in worship today. Most of our team has been out because of spring break. Um, As many of you know, people travel or they're working for masters, and so Adam joins us every once in a while, and so we're grateful he was able to be with us um, this week. Um, Thank you also for bearing with us with the lights. It looks like we have them all on right now, but we have uh, had issues with those this morning. Hopefully, we'll get those taken care of uh, this week. But if you're a first-time guest with us, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Uh, Whether you're joining us online or whether here in person, uh, we would love to know that you're here with us. Um, If you've not done so already, there was a Connect card in your program or in the seat pocket in front of you. If you're joining us online, our service host can point you to the right link. But if you would, fill that out. Let us know that you're here. Um, We have a VIP center in the very front atrium that you can drop that off. Uh, We'll have a team there that will greet you, see if you have any questions, but also provide a gift for you. If you're a returning guest, we have another gift for you called Right Now Media. Um, As my dad uh, uh, shared during the message, um, that is a free gift that we provide to you. And um, the only way to get it is to go through a church. And so uh, if you're interested in that, it's an online compilation of video Bible studies. There's over 10,000 different Bible studies. I even found here recently there is like college level doctrinal and theological level studies on there. Um, I actually gave one away this week. Uh, My uh, wife Nikki had a cohort in Henderson, Nevada, which is a little bit outside of Nevada uh, or outside of Las Vegas. And I was there uh, with another uh, pastor and we're eating at the most glorious place called In-N-Out Burger. And uh, as we're sitting there, we hear this discussion taking place about the Bible. And, you know, as my dad was talking about with science and stuff, you hear just the differing viewpoints. And I'm just sitting there like, I've got to say something. And he could tell I wanted to say something. He's like, no. And I was like, Nick's about to enter the chat. Um, Because it it was fine until the guy started sharing things that were just completely false uh, theology. Uh, And the scripture says, Paul said, if anyone preaches a different gospel, um, let him be accursed. And this guy had shared that he was biblically illiterate. And so I took five minutes not to sound like some, you know, arrogant person, but I just simply said, hey, y'all were talking about the Bible. What is that? And, and, and let them answer what the Bible was. Um, and then I shared with them that I was a pastor. Uh, but also at the end, I said, here is the link. Uh, you can go sign up for Right Now Media. Uh, because as one says, they were biblically illiterate. The other, uh, a young Christian seemingly. Uh, and so that's something that you can even offer to others. It's on our website. Uh, if you know, like there's a, mar- a, a, a couple that's going through marital issues. There's, there's uh, studies for marriage. If uh, someone's having issues with par- uh, parenting, um, there's parenting studies on there. And so if you need that link that you can share that with others, or if you get their email, you can send it to Casey um, and we'll, we'll sign them up. And that's a great, great resource to help someone uh, in understanding biblical understanding of things like marriage and parenting or just spiritual growth. And so that's our gift to you, but also it can be a tool that you can share with other people. And so take that same card, make sure we have your name and email, mark the box that says Right Now Media, and we'll get that sent to you this week. We've got Spring into Ministry coming up. That's going to be a ministry fundraiser yard sale. And so if you have anything that you would like to donate to that, or if you're a vendor and would like to set up a table and sell your goods, please see Katie Steiner or email her. Um, Her email is on our website under our team page, uh, and let her know that you would like to get involved or that you have things to donate. Uh, Also, Spring into Ministry is happening uh, the last two Sundays of April, we're going to have a ministry expo that you can go by, find your place in ministry, or find out how you can pray for our various ministries that are taking place. If you sing or play an instrument, we've got open auditions coming up on April 30th. We've got a few people signed up, but especially on weeks like this, you, as you can tell, it'd be great to have multiple roles and backup uh, when 
a lot of our team has to be out. And then also the Men of Valor Conference is coming up on August 22nd through the 24th. Men, uh, I believe we've got like just a day or two left to get the cheapest price on that. Um, for all of these things that need to be signed up for, you can go to hopeaugusta.family, hopeaugusta.family, and you can register for those. And then also the student camp is coming up June 24th through the 28th. We still have space for that. And so any students that have not signed up grades 6 through 12th, uh, we would love to have you participate. Go to hopeaugusta.family and sign up for that. We would love to have you participate in that. Thank you so much for being with us here today. We look forward to seeing you next week and continuing this series. Y'all have a great week. If you're into golf, go watch the Masters. Have fun. We'll see you next Sunday.